double dealing, fraud, falsehood, lying, fakery, cheating, manipulation. What do all these have in common? They're all names for deception. Eventually, the one doing the deceiving pays the cost for their deception. Jacob discovers this the hard way. We're continuing our study of the first book of the Bible, Genesis, the book of beginnings. Certainly by now, we all agree that this book is filled with drama but it is also filled with information and instructions that we that can help us live better happier healthier more peaceful and prosperous lives in this book we find many dramatic beginnings this book begins with god speaking a perfect universe into existence it tells of god creating our first parents adam and eve the drama unfolds with the beginning of sin on this planet when Adam and Eve make the mistake of disregarding God's instructions. Their choice is the beginning of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil was something God wanted to protect them from. However, their disobedience introduced the knowledge of good and evil to the entire human race. Thus we learn of the beginning of God's plan to redeem us humans and the battle between good and evil. Heavenly Father, Jesus is our perfect pattern, our perfect example. When we look at him, we see our true state. By beholding him, we recognize our need to be changed, purified, elevated to a higher degree. Here, Father, we consecrate and dedicate ourselves to obeying your word in proclaiming a relationship with you, dear God. Let it be our purpose to never harmonize with worldly principles. Instead of us harmonizing with the world, dear God, help us to be people of integrity and honesty as opposed to deception and pretense. Help us reflect the image of Christ in our daily walk. In Jesus' name, amen. Our key text is Genesis 27, 36. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? The wrong we do will surely come back to haunt us. This we discover with Jacob and Laban in Genesis 29, 1 through 30. After many days, Jacob arrived in Mesopotamia at the city where his grandfather Bethuel and his mother's brother Laban lived. He noticed a well on the outskirts of the city where the three flocks of sheep waiting to be watered, but there was a huge stone covering the mouth of the well. The custom was that the stone could not be rolled away until all the flocks had been in from the field. And after they had been watered, then the stone would be rolled back again. He walked over to the shepherds and asked, where are you from? They replied, we are originally from Haran. Jacob says, do you know a man named Laban whose grandfather is Nahar? Jacob asked, how is he? Fine, they said. In fact, here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the family sheep. Jacob says, there's something strange about all this. This isn't the time of day to bring in sheep from the field and let them stand here. Why don't you men water your sheep and then take them back to pasture? There's still lots of day left. They said, we don't do that because it's the custom that no flock is watered ahead of any other. Only when they're all here do we roll away the stone. Jacob and the men were still talking about the customs of watering when Rachel arrived with her flock. 
And when Jacob saw Rachel taking her place in the line to water his, his uncle's Laban's flock, he went to the well and rolled away the stone so she and the men could water their sheep. While Rachel was waiting her turn, Jacob went over and introduced himself as her cousin, then kissed her on the cheek and began to weep. When she learned that he was Rachel's son, she ran home to tell her father, leaving the servants in charge of the sheep. When Laban heard that his sister's son was here, he ran to the well to meet him. He hugged him, kissed him on both cheeks, brought him home and did everything he could to make him feel welcome. Then Jacob told the family everything that happened since his mother left their home. When he finished, Laban said, you are a bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Stay here for the next month and see if you like it. So Jacob stayed and helped Laban take care of his sheep. One day, Laban said to Jacob, you shouldn't be working for me for nothing just because you are my nephew. How much do you want me to pay you? Laban had two daughters. Leah was the oldest and Rachel the youngest. Leah had weak eyes and little personality and Rachel was shapely with beautiful eyes and a sparkling personality. Jacob loved Rachel from the first day he saw her. He said to Laban, I'm in love with your daughter, Rachel, but I don't have the right kind of security to think about marriage. I'm willing to stay here and work for you for seven years to build up a financial base. If at the end of that time, you let me marry Rachel. Laban said, I would prefer that you marry her to keep our families together than to have some stranger marry her. I'll accept your offer and we'll look forward to the wedding. So Jacob worked seven years for Laban to pay the dowry to ra marry Rachel. He loved Rachel very much and was so happy to be near her that the seven years seemed like nothing. When the time was up, Jacob went to Laban and said, I have kept my part of the arrangement and shown myself successful to guarantee Rachel a secure future. I will now like to go ahead and get married. Laban agreed and set a date for the wedding. He planned a big celebration, invited family and friends from near and far. During the reception, when the time came for the bride to go to the bridal chamber, as a sign of marriage, Laban sent Leah instead of Rachel, and she willingly took part in the deception. A little while later, Jacob followed. In the dark and his uh, eagerness to consummate their marriage, Jacob made love to Leah without realizing who she was. It was a custom to let the bride keep her servant girl with her even after the marriage which Leah did. Her name was Zelpha. In the morning, when Jacob woke up and looked at his sleeping bride, it wasn't Rachel, it was Leah. He was furious and stormed out of the tent. He went to Laban and said, what in the world have you done to me? I worked for you for seven years so I could marry Rachel and you agreed but you've given me Leah. How could you do that to me? And Laban said, calm down. You've been in our country long enough to know that it's not culturally acceptable to let the younger daughter get married before the older one. Let's finish the week long reception. And at the end of the week, I'll announce to everyone that I'm giving you Rachel as well. That is providing you work for me another seven years. Jacob agreed because he loved Rachel. So he went through the week long celebration, looking forward to the end of the week. On the last day of the, the feast, Laban announced to everyone that he was giving Rachel to Jacob to be his second wife. And as the custom was, Rachel kept her servant girl 
Belhar, just as Leah had done. And after Rachel had gone to the bridal chamber, Jacob followed her and consummated his marriage to Rachel as he had for Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. The first thing Jacob sees when he arrives at his destination is a stone. The stone is a reminder of Bethel. The stone of Bethel signifies God's presence, according to Genesis 28, 18, and 19. Now, in the case of this stone, the stone is on the well. It gives Jacob a chance to interact with Rachel. When Jacob hears from the shepherds that Rachel is coming with her sheep to water her flock, he asks the shepherds to roll away the stone. However, the shepherds refuse. Their refusal gives Jacob the opportunity to roll away the stone himself and introduce himself to Rachel. It was love at first sight. Rachel responds by running to her family. Jacob immediately falls in love with Rachel. Genesis 29, 18 says, Jacob loved Rachel. He loved her so much he was willing to work for Laban for seven years in exchange for her hand in marriage. Jacob loved Rachel so much, those seven years seemed like only a few days. Now, here is where it gets really interesting. At the end of the seven years, Jacob is deceived. Does it sound familiar? Jacob deceives his brother Esau and his father Isaac. Now, on the night of the wedding for Jacob and Rachel, Laban switched Rachel, the younger sister, for Leah, the older sister. The next day, Jacob wakes up to the wrong bride. Taking advantage of the confusion of the wedding feast and of Jacob's intense excitement and susceptibility, Laban had managed this deception. Interestingly enough, Jacob uses the same root word for deceived in Genesis 29, 25 that Isaac, his father used in Genesis 27, 35 to characterize Jacob's behavior toward his father and his brother. Jacob says to Laban in Genesis 29, 25, why have you deceived me? This shows that there is no doubt that Jacob knows that deception is wrong. This same principle is in the writings of Moses. An eye must be put out for an eye. A tooth must be knocked out for a tooth. A hand must be cut off for a hand and a foot for a foot, as in Exodus 21, 24 and Genesis 9, 6. The Bible principle forces the person who does the wrong to get the same punishment they gave to the one they hurt. From this experience, Jacob now understands how Esau and his father must have felt. Here, God teaches Jacob about his own lies, deception, manipulation, and trickery by the lies and trickery, deception, and manipulation of Laban. This has a deep lesson for us. We must learn to trust God when people use deception on us and get away with doing evil. Rather than taking matters in our own hand, as Esau had planned to do, we must learn to allow God to handle it. Jacob now has two wives, Leah and Rachel. How does he manage having a family with sister wives? Find out in part five, the blessings of the family.